coming up on this week's show. During the pandemic, many of us realised just how intense was our passion for travel. And I'm so excited about the opportunities to explore economically and responsibly this year. The Ukrainian artwork that's now found a safe home on display at a gallery in Madrid. And who discovered the equator? También en las culturas milenarias se han creado ciencia y tecnología. Sabían esta que estaban en el centro del mundo. Welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from behind the scenes at our home here at the BBC in London. It's here where we plan the shows and edit the films from all over the world, finding stories, juggling logistics, and just like everyone else, trying to find the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to travelling abroad. For the past decade here at The Travel Show HQ, it's been our job to create new content for you every week on a fairly modest budget. So no wonder we picked up a tip or two along the way about how to get the most for our money. We get the best value we can by packing in as much as possible on each trip, traveling light and using our network of local fixers and producers as often as we can to help bring down travel costs and our carbon footprint. Well, how can you save money when you travel abroad in 2023? Here's our global guru, Simon Calder, with some ideas. When so many of us are feeling the squeeze financially, it's no wonder that some travellers are considering cutting back on adventures. When money is tight, seeing your ideal destination on TV or social media can stir up a load of negative feelings and leave you believing that your dream holiday is just that, a dream. In 2022, the Travel Show team went dune bashing in Qatar, attended age-old ceremonies in Chile, and saw some amazing creatures that also call this planet home at Yellowstone. Right over there in the distance, it's a grizzly bear. And this is how you can get to some of these destinations. The USA is full of wish list locations, Hollywood, Miami Beach, New York City and natural wonders like Yellowstone, which Lucy and the Travel Show visited in early 2022, coinciding with its 150th anniversary as a national park. So this is Old Faithful, probably one of the world's most famous geezers. And there she goes. People save for years to see amazing places like Yellowstone. But with the cost of living soaring, are such trips becoming out of reach? As always, if you can travel at times of low demand, you'll get the best deal. Keep costs down by taking cabin baggage only. Most transatlantic airlines now charge extra for anything you want to check into the hold, but at the same time offer generous hand luggage allowances and there's less chance that your valuables will go astray. In April, UK air passenger duty for flights to North America increases to £87, or in anything other than basic economy, 191 You can avoid the tax by taking a ship to Dublin or a train to Paris and booking a flight from there, but allow plenty of time to make the connection. If you miss the onward flight, you're not getting a refund. The same idea works in the opposite direction. If you're starting in North America and planning to visit a number of European countries, make Britain the first nation you visit, not the last. For all its colour, scenery and wonders, South America appears on the wish lists of surprisingly few travellers, and that may not be about to change. According to a survey by the leading UK Travel Association, ABTA, significantly fewer travellers this year are looking to visit a country they've never been to before. 
With shrinking disposable income, that's understandable. But try and think big. In late March, Carmen and the team switched spring for the Southern Hemisphere autumn in the long, thin and spectacular South American nation of Chile and got to take part in some amazing experiences. When you think of mummies, you think of the ancient Egyptians wrapped in bandages. But these guys here, the sticks are where bones are, there's masks. And, and what's fascinating is these smaller mummies of children and babies. South America really rewards travellers who can invest time. And a trend we've noticed at the travel show, which is backed up by industry data, is that the average length of stay is increasing. If you can spend weeks rather than days in a place, you'll get under the skin of it and have a much more enriching and enlightening experience. Even better, stay with a family to understand the culture more deeply and to keep a lid on costs. Homestays are easy to find online and typically have a minimum stay of a week or two. Last month, the first ever and sometimes controversial FIFA World Cup to be held in the Middle East came to its thrilling conclusion as Argentina lifted the trophy in Qatar. Every global sporting event creates a kind of travel vacuum after the games are over. But the alluring setting, the culture, the nature, not to mention the sunshine and the beaches, remains, as Rajan discovered when he visited the Gulf state in the build-up to the tournament. What are we in my mouth? Yes. Oh, wow. So I put my this mouth side. here? Yes. Oh, wow. Close it, yes. And same one, right, right hand. No, no, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. No, <laughs> again, again, okay. If the Middle East is on your list of places to go this year, now could be a very good time to be there. Since the World Cup, Qatar has a vast number of hotel rooms to fill, and so it's become the region's bargain basement location. In February, a room in a good budget hotel in central Doha, five minutes walk from the National Museum, 10 minutes from the souk, is selling at around $60 a night. That's roughly half what you pay for the equivalent property across in Dubai. At the travel show, it isn't just money we're looking to save, it's the planet as well. Happily, the two often go hand in hand. Last summer, Addy and the team saw the effects of climate change itself. Since the fires have hit this whole area, it now looks very different. As they visited the Greek island of Evia to see how it was recovering from devastating forest fires. Look at that. Just as far as the eye can see, all you can, all you're looking at is burnt trees. Environmentally, tourism is unquestionably part of the problem. But if Greece is on your travel agenda this year, then there are ways of limiting the impact on the planet and your pocket. Between the two biggest cities, the capital Athens and Thessaloniki in the north, it used to be that the only quick way to make the journey was by plane. Thankfully, there's a new and much more environmentally friendly high-speed railway, taking under four hours between the two cities. You can save money by being under 24 or over 64. And if you're somewhere in the middle, just sign up for the HT card. It's free and it gives you a 15% discount, reducing the cost of the cheapest ticket from nine euros to less than eight. This is the classic Africa of storybooks and the location of the Great Migration. For me, the most remarkable travel show trip of 2022 was the one that ended the year. A two-parter out in Africa called How Does a Blind Girl Go on Safari? in which visually impaired social media star Lucy Edwards joined the team in Kenya Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's completely fine. But honestly, when you call Baraka a blessing, it is a blessing. It is a blessing to be blind because it means 
He's meant to teach people a lesson. Mm. He's, meant to, he's meant to be here to, to get people to understand that you shouldn't be poaching these beautiful animals. The film made me think more deeply about Africa and in particular the wildlife that coexists often uneasily with humanity. I've been lucky enough to go on safari in seven African countries and I found the costs are lowest in Uganda and Zimbabwe, with Namibia also offering some good deals. To limit the cost and the environmental impact, consider going on a guided walking safari rather than just hopping into the nearest 4x4. You might find it a more memorable experience. During the pandemic, many of us realised just how intense was our passion for travel. And I'm so excited about the opportunities to explore economically and responsibly this year. I've not regretted a single trip I've ever taken, only those I've had to cancel. Go out and see the world. I'll meet you on the road. Next up, we're off to Ecuador, and in the 18th century, French scientists thought they'd discovered the location of the equator. But they got it wrong. Thousands of years earlier, the pre-Incas were able to plot its location almost as accurately as the modern-day GPS. And Sam Supple finds out how they did it. This is the South American nation of Ecuador. Famed for the wildlife haven that is the Galapagos Islands and large swathes of the Amazon rainforest. But let's not forget the meaning of Ecuador's name itself, the equator. And in 1982, to mark its position as the middle of the earth, the Ciudad Mitad del Mundo monument was opened on the site of the imaginary line that divides the northern and southern hemisphere. Since then, it has attracted hundreds and thousands of visitors. Its location was based on a series of expeditions carried out by the French Academy of Science in the 18th century, known as the French Geodesic Mission. But since the advent of GPS, it's been discovered that the site is actually wrong by 240 meters. This, in fact, is where the equator is. Now, it may feel wrong to compare technology from the 18th century to what we have in the modern day. But a civilization known as the Quitos, who lived in Ecuador even before the Incas, had already worked out the true location. No es que la ciencia viene solamente del mundo occidental. También en las culturas milenarias se han creado ciencia y tecnología y está, eh, está la evidencia que han durado miles de años. Sabían esta, que estaban en el centro del mundo, y sabían eh, todo lo que significaba, todos los efectos eh, de, del sol. El manejo de la astronomía fue muy importante. Travel to Catequila above the city of Quito, and you'll find an important pre Incan astronomical observatory used to learn more about the seasons as well as space. Y lo importante de Catequilla es que es una montaña que está, eso sí, en la latitud 00. Porque en el Catequilla también está una construcción semicircular que no es Inca, es pre-Inca. Ahora, desde Catequilla es un lugar importantísimo porque se ve toda la Vía Láctea. Una de las particularidades de esta región es que solamente en la latitud cero nosotros podemos observar absolutamente todas las estrellas del firmamento. Si vamos para el norte, por ejemplo, para México, para el sur, Perú, ya no podemos ver algunas estrellas del, del sur o del norte. En la línea ecuatorial podemos ver el 100% de las estrellas. Entonces, aquí posiblemente se generó una conciencia integral de la observación de la bóveda celeste. As the world faces ever-growing problems such as climate change, experts like Christabel believe that this discovery proves that some of the answers we need don't lie with new discoveries in the future, but lay buried in our past. Más bien, la idea de una tierra cuadrada, plana, 
viene del medioevo de Europa, donde surgió el oscurantismo y se opacó al conocimiento, pero parece que en América no. Yo creo que en estos aspectos de estas culturas americanas, como nos ha demostrado la matemática maya, estaba mucho más adelantado que otras culturas alrededor del mundo. Esta gente fue muy sabia del uso de los recursos naturales, del agua, los suelos, la biodiversidad. Ahora tenemos que ver la historia con pragmatismo, entender que cada sitio arqueológico es una fuente de información del uso inteligente de los recursos naturales para poder rescatar nichos ecológicos, quebradas, para un uso inteligente del agua, ¿no? del suelo para los cultivos. Por ejemplo. Entonces, ese, esa es la dirección que la ciencia eh, está tomando de presente y hacia el futuro. Well, finally this week, a year on from the start of the war in Ukraine, it's not only the country's population and infrastructure that has come under bombardment, but also much of its cultural heritage. Recently, a secret convoy of trucks containing 51 works of art managed to avoid Russian shelling and slipped out of Ukraine to travel all the way to Madrid for safekeeping. And if you're heading to the Spanish capital, you can see the collection there until the end of April. Here's the story of how it got there. Cultural heritage of Ukraine is in danger in the moment. I think that museum is in danger too. And uh, in a sense, uh, the paintings were taken to safety. I hope that they will stay in Europe for a long period of time. Uh, the museum, National Museum of Ukraine, is situated in the government district of Kyiv. It's basically, you know, stone throw from uh, the cabinet of minister, very close, uh, is uh, situated very close to the presidential administration. So in case of attack on the government district, the museum will be in uh, very high danger. Siempre que hay una guerra, las obras de arte, curiosamente, se convierten en un objetivo político estratégico de primer, de primer nivel y eso nos da una idea de, de lo importante que es el arte verdaderamente. Y, y la prueba real de que ese peligro está ahí y es inminente es que cuando las fuerzas ucranianas han recuperado Gerson, han encontrado que sus dos principales museos habían sido expoliados. Rusia había organizado el traslado de las principales obras de esos museos a Crimea. La cantidad de problemas que hemos enfrentado fue increíble. Los museos estaban básicamente barricados en el cuarto donde las obras fueron removidas, literalmente dos meses, viviendo en el cuarto, porque no podían ir a la casa porque la transportación pública no funcionó, la electricidad cortó. Uh, air raids, and of course we had many problems organizing shipment of this art. Uh, as you can imagine, there is no insurance company in the world which is ready to insure anything moving through Ukraine. Two trucks reached Polish border, we were already relieved, and in that very moment a missile exploded in the Polish village. Poland immediately closed the border. In that moment, everybody thought that it's the beginning of the Third World War. Ukrainian diplomats in Madrid talked to Ukrainian diplomats in Poland. And after 10, more than 10 hours on the border, Poles organized passage for these trucks when the border was still closed. And by sheer miracle, these trucks arrived to Madrid on time. Cuando el camión que trae las obras de Ucrania, las 51 obras, llega al museo, la, las sensaciones de, de satisfacción y de, y de felicidad absoluta, ellos nos decían qué felicidad que estas obras se puedan ver, porque nuestros museos están vacíos. Los museos ucranianos llevan desde febrero cerrados, las paredes están vacías, eso es una tristeza. La reacción es de, de orgullo total de satisfacción de ver que, que su, su arte y su cultura son reconocidos, al mismo tiempo que, evidentemente, de, 
de tristeza de pensar que estas obras están aquí porque no pueden estar allí. Para mí, esta obra es simbólica. Y, por supuesto, es parte de la cultura del heritage, es parte de la identidad. Y estoy extremadamente feliz. Están ahora right uh, en Madrid, en safety. During the opening, I was pinching myself to be sure that it's a reality because it was so difficult to believe that it will happen. Um, that, uh, in a sense, for me, it was a miracle. Realizar esta exposición en España hace que, que inmediatamente venga a nuestra cabeza la memoria de la guerra civil y cómo en ese momento se decidió que era necesario evacuar una serie de obras maestras del Museo del Prado a Suiza y, y estuvieron ahí protegidas y volvieron una vez había acabado la guerra. Realizando este proyecto, todo el rato hemos tenido en la cabeza ese episodio y cómo verdaderamente en momentos de guerra existe la necesidad de proteger el patrimonio cultural de una nación, porque forma parte intrínseca de lo que esa nación significa y de, de su memoria histórica. Well, let's hope those pieces of art will one day be able to be enjoyed back in Kyiv. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Coming up next week. We're off to New York to see how the Big Apple's legendary nightlife is finally back with a bang. And also asking, just how ethical is it for tourists to go and see ancient Egyptian mummies in museums thousands of years after they died? These are human bodies and no one would accept to have a member of his family displayed in such a matter where people take selfies. Well, that's bound to be a good one, so hope you can catch that next week. And don't forget, there's more great travel content on the BBC. The details are at the bottom of your screen now. But in the meantime, from me, Carmen Roberts, and the rest of the Travel Show team here at HQ in London, it's goodbye.